Welcome to Lyme Time. I'm Allie from the Tick Chicks. We are all more than Lyme disease and chronic illness, and together we stand with you to overcome and rise. I'll bring you closer to the experts in cutting edge treatments and even a few unexpected ways of healing. I'll ask the questions you want answers to regarding Lyme disease and successful ways of getting you closer to 100%. We are in this together and will not be defined by Lyme. Today, my guest is Dr. Ashley Beckman, and Dr. Ashley is the doctor of Chinese medicine and acupuncture, board certified acupuncturist and herbalist, functional medicine practitioner, and epigenetics expert in Los Angeles. She's right down the road from me. She received her doctorate in healthy aging and longevity and wrote her thesis on epigenetics, the study of how our genes are affected by our diet and lifestyle. During her last 10 years as an acupuncturist at Dr. Soram Khalsa's busy functional medicine practice in Beverly Hills, Dr. Ashley performed over 50,000 treatments. She currently practices virtually in Malibu, California, and she specializes in root cause medicine, cellular detoxification from mold, Lyme and environmental toxins, hormone balancing, and epigenetics. She has also co-founded Golden Path Alchemy, an organic skincare company based on the principles of traditional Chinese medicine. Welcome, Dr. Ashley. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. It's my pleasure. I know that you and I have tried to connect for a little while now, and I'm just thrilled to have you here. I want to start the way I start with all my guests. There's a reason you're here and specializing in what you do for our community. So can you tell me a bit about your journey and your childhood and all the things that led up to, to this moment? Sure. Uh, so actually most recently, I kind of left a home that had mold, um, quite a bit of mold toxicity. So I have been studying different toxins and things like that for many years. And I've worked with different practitioners where this was their specialty. So people that predominantly either had Lyme and a lot of co-infections or you know, where they were looking at other environmental triggers, heavy metals and things like that. But I had always been interested in nutrition growing up and I did grow up in Texas. So our nutrition, you know, nutrition in the, in the 80s was, uh, you know, ate healthy at home, but had a lot of snacks and treats that were packaged foods and trips to 7-Eleven and McDonald's and things like that. So it's very interesting to see how, you know, the patterns and the foundation can be set, right? And you might have some things underlying in your system that don't do so well with uh, our modern food, I guess I would say, right? So as a child, I had recurring strep infections. I got sick quite a bit and had headaches and some joint pains and things like that, but never really thought too much about it. And I was also a C-section child. And also my mom was told by her doctor that formula was better, right? So that was kind of the foundation that probably set up the food intolerances and things that I had in my future. So fast forward, I was in grad school for acupuncture and Chinese medicine. And one day I kind of woke up and or I got off the couch and it was so painful. I couldn't really walk. My ankles hurt so badly, my wrists and hands. It was hard to hold a cell phone, things like that. And so I went to my general practitioner and she just said, well, you know, I can test you, but you probably have some sort of autoimmune issue that might show up in 10 years, but probably won't. And there's nothing you can do. So I started researching a bit more since I was in school for natural medicine and the Chinese theory, which is its own whole system of medicine. And I sort of landed on seeing that certain foods could cause more inflammation. So I was digging in a little bit about gluten and dairy and sugar especially for myself. But again, the doctor said, oh, you know, I'll test you. I don't think you have celiac disease, but that's the only test we can do. So of course that was negative. And again, there, from my perspective, I just kind of didn't feel great. And every time I ate the food, I had 
horrible pain and migraines even. I got to the point where I was having migraines where, you know, with vomiting uh, needed to be in a dark room and non-functional for a day or so until they passed. And it was just kind of, you know, these symptoms that I had for many years and I had been in a car accident. So I kind of attributed everything to pain wise to a car accident and food. And then I kind of came to realize there are these things, these layers of root causes, right? There are other things that could have happened to contribute to this. So, and another thing was my husband at the, or it was sorry, boyfriend at the time had gotten bitten by a tick and was in the hospital for a week with high fever. And so we didn't really know there nothing was ever diagnosed um, because they didn't run those tests in the hospital, right? And- No, why would they? Yeah. <laughs> And it was just this mystery fever, right? And a healthy, you know, whatever, 30 year old male. And even though I was in natural medicine, I didn't think too much about it, right? Because he was the one that got um, bitten. And so, yeah, I just many years, I happened to work with doctors that specialized in these sort of mystery illnesses and trying to really figure out what's going on with somebody and not just you know, treating their diagnosis, right? So I became very passionate about this because I always know there's something, you know, there's a reason why your body is inflamed or there's a reason why you have an autoimmune reaction. And, and so I just really wanted to get deeper and deeper into that. And I happened to notice many of my patients most recently, mold exposure was a huge contributing factor. And especially for people that, you know, had kind of gotten better from a lot of their things they've had in the past. So some chronic Lyme or um, especially Epstein-Barr reactivation, things like that. I, I was just seeing this pattern. And so I really started to focus a lot on diving deep into learning a lot more about mold toxicity and exposure. So, and yeah, and then I ended up living in a home with one of the highest scores that the, you know, our remediator had seen and he basically kind of said, get out now if you can. Was that here in California? It was, yeah. Okay. So um, I had actually not had a lot of uh, joint pain or, and I, I haven't had migraines in years um, and no headaches either. And I actually had started eating dairy again, which you know I hadn't done for 10 years um, because I'd really gotten through all these layers and had cleaned up so many things through you know, the protocol I put my patients on, but I, I do everything as well, right? I don't, sure. um, I practice what I preach and, I, and I'm here because I've been through this too. So um, I started just not feeling well again. And I thought, oh, this is weird. This is kind of how I felt 15 years ago, right? And, um, and because I run labs on my clients, I thought, oh, this is, Oh, sorry, I was alerted that we had a leak in our foundation of our house by the water company. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> this is not good. Yeah. So then, okay, we ran, here. <laughs> yeah, we ran labs on um, everyone in the family and we all had quite a bit of elevated mold that wasn't there before. So it just re-triggered very latent old symptoms. So I'm I have been in the process of kind of going on the protocol I put my patients on again. Did you have to, did you have to move or did you remediate? And well, so we were renting. So we, um, we left. Yeah. Right. And, and again, the, you know, it was, it's always so interesting because we're like, as a practitioner, I'm often the patient too. Right. So like I said, I have done all the protocols. I've tried almost everything that I have ever asked my clients to try. And the same thing is, is um, with this is I had just decided because of how much I saw mold that affected most of my clients that I was going to learn even more about kind of the other side because I referred out to other people about how to clean, you know, how to clean things, what to toss, what to keep. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so then now I, I learned a whole lot more about all that whole aspect, which is a part of what you need to know. Right. Absolutely. It's and a big puzzle. Really yes. It's a big puzzle with, with a lot of, um, and, and I know you specialize in root cause. Yes. And I think that's probably what our, what our listeners want to hear most about, which sure. would be just, you know, 
first of all, I'm going to get into epigenetics, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, mm -hmm. and then some other things that you specialize in. But first and foremost, uh, what would you like to tell everyone out there about getting to the root cause of their illness? Sure. So a few things. So generally there's, gen there's, if it, if we could point to one thing that, that would be so amazing, have I ever found a patient that that really applies to? No. Right. So it's generally the body can handle so much. Right. And then you put another, I'll just say an assault or something um, that adds stress or a toxin or a traumatic event, right. To your body. And then another thing happens or, you know, then you move or you move to a new part of the country where there are different toxins and things in the air, even, or the water, or we, you know, you just, the system becomes overwhelmed. And so everyone has a different amount of what they can handle. And that's where some of the genetics can come in, right? How we process toxins um, can vary. And also though, like I said, it would be so simple, you know, it's just rare if someone just had an exposure to one thing and that's kind of what took them down, right? Right. So it's often these layers that have been growing. Um, and that's why even somebody's childhood home where there was mold and, you know, we don't think about any of these things before. Like I grew up in Texas, initially in the basement flooded all the time. You know, we would walk on kind of like a an elevated floor because there was water in the on the ground a lot, right? And these things are just normal, right? And um, for people that right live somewhere and they have a um, dehumidifiers and things like that, like that, there's just a lot of moisture in a lot of places naturally. And so, but again, a childhood home like that could be the beginning, and an exposure could be the beginning of you know, a child's depression and anxiety, and that mold doesn't come out of the body naturally unless you go in and take something for that, right? So a lot of these things start many years prior to us feeling any of the side effects, or we think it's, oh, it's just some anxiety, or oh, it's a little mm -hmm. depression, right? But those things aren't normal in children, and we're seeing it more and more. I, I, I feel as though, you know, there are so many layers and if, if you sort of, and we'll talk more about genetics, but you know, it's all about the terrain of your body and your system at the time that this traumatic experience happens, whether it's mold exposure, you know, a car accident or a kick bite or whatever. And then it just unleashes the storm. Yes. Um, so let's talk about epigenetics and tell me how you go about testing for epigenetics, especially now that you're practicing mostly virtually, which must be amazing to, to treat people around the world, but how, how do you go about doing that to uh, a new patient? Sure. So I have a test kit that I use. I had studied with a company for a few years that I really uh, love their integrity and love their specific tests because it actually has a very specific set of genetic SNPs that are used for specifically for Lyme disease, mold exposure, um, how you process environmental toxins, but pollutants versus heavy metals. And, and then also how you process hormones, right? Because some of the breakdown of hormones can also be toxic. And so these, these tests could actually tell you, tell me, let's say I'm your patient, it would actually tell me how I specifically react to all these different things, even viruses and virus exposure. So don't, viruses isn't part of the panel, vi vi a viral panel is not part of it, but all the other ones I mentioned are. So just for example, in mold, right? There's 25% of the population that are significantly more reactive to mold. Um, part of the panel is also for histamine. So again, these are people that are more prone to having histamine type reactions. The one for Lyme disease, the gathering that they've put together of the specific gen genetic SNPs is for how severe the uh, Lyme disease like presentation could be for you. Okay. Right? So, because as we know, and this happens all the time, right? Somebody could get, could have certain, you know, Lyme infection or, co or co-infections and they have a pretty mild version compared to somebody who it completely destroys their life, right? 
Yeah. And so, I've even had friends that have Lyme show up in their blood and they, they have absolutely no symptoms. Right. And and then, there, so there you go with terrain, right? So our job is basically, or my job is trying to remove or reduce the level of these different toxins or um, pathogens and things like that to a load that your, your system can deal with and is not represented by symptoms in your, in your body, right? So, but again, there's certain people that they can handle things pretty well. And then there's other ones that they, they might even show very low on a lab, right? With the amount, but it is, you know, completely ruining their life, right? So let's talk a little bit about um, heavy metals. This has yeah. always been a question of mine. Sure. Do, do you, are you seeing a difference in generations? Um, you know, because maybe in my childhood, we were, I might have been exposed to more heavy metals, possibly because there weren't as many regulated at that time, as opposed to now, or are there kids now that are actually exposed to more? And what are they, and how, how, are, how are people typically exposed to heavy metal to, um, tox, toxicity? Sure. So it also depends to right on, for some people, it's not always the biggest issue, right? The metals, like I often find that that is not as huge of an issue as some of these other more potent um, biotoxins, right? Like the mold exposure is pretty important in the fact that it basically can attack all of the whole, like almost all systems in the body, right? Mm. Where some of the, again, that is also some accumulation of metals can be in different organs too. So that is not good, but it also it does depend. It seems like actually more people are having heavy metal exposure now, but again, it really depends on I think how much, if they can excrete it, what, what, where they got it from, right? And there's something different between the organic and inorganic metals, but again, and then parasites too, right? So a lot of the uh, heavy metals can live inside or ha can be housed in the parasites. So you have to make sure that you're doing a parasite protocol too, if you're doing a heavy metal protocol and you would need to work on the parasites in the gut first. Otherwise you could be working on all of the metals in the organs and then not really addressing the others. And that's gonna be also still implicated in probably what's keeping you not feeling too well. So, but yet there are a lot of metals in our environment and things like that. So where there are more regulations, it's still quite unregulated, right? And where a lot of children especially get exposure or a lot of people, eat fish, they think that that's a healthier option. And there's quite a bit in our world. Unfortunately, it should be a great clean source, but it's not. Right. And so fish kind of leads to more, I guess it, 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 it does contain heavy metals, but also parasites. So that could be a double whammy. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, she's probably one of the worst, right? <laughs> I don't even know where to go with that? Because I mean, you're right. It's, it's hard to know. Um, and then I'm, you know, a lot of people ask me, Oh, did you, what did, how, what happened when you did your parasite cleanse? I don't really necessarily think that just because you have Lyme disease means you have anything else, you know, or there might've been a trigger early on. Like for me, it was uh, mono. I had a bad case of mono when I was younger. And then after Lyme, I got, um, EBV, right. or maybe it came before. I don't know. I had my great doctor who finally tested me for Lyme disease say, you know, Lyme disease is rarely the first thing to come along and right. kind of rarely to be the last thing. So, you know, right. as long as you can get on top of the Lyme, by the time you know you have Lyme disease and learn how to get on top of it, you can hopefully prevent things from happening and progressing from there. Right. Um, and so Chinese medicine, I know that your two levels of real expertise are something that jumped out of me at me in your bio were the epigenetics and how skilled you are in that and also Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. And can you explain to our listeners, you know, how it differs from other treatments? Oh, sure. So I would say the biggest thing, and this is again, 
how I feel with epigenetics and just in general is that each, each person is unique and individual and needs a very specific treatment to that person. And even at that time of where they are in their, their life, right? Or their journey with however they're feeling. And so one thing that drew me to Chinese medicine is the partly the concept basically of the emotional side of a physical ailment too. So basically mm. you really can't separate them. I mean, unless it's something like a broken bone, you know, there's not an emotional connection with that per se. But when we look at something, for example, that's um, attacking the lungs or, you know, you have a lot of lung issues, the lungs represent uh, stored grief and sadness, right? And so I think most people are kind of aware that there is a big correlation with stored trauma or perceived trauma and emotional side of, you know, why someone might stay or is chronically ill, right? Because it's often a piece that needs to be resolved or at least looked at and see, you know, again, you can have something happen to one person and one is totally fine and the other is really difficult situation for them, right? And something might manifest quickly for them as a physical ailment or more often than not, most people kind of, it's a bit repressed and they, they're not really dealing with it. And I think it comes up later in their life. Mm. But I love the Chinese theory, right? Of these, the different organs, the emotional side of them, like what feelings are stored in the body and where. Mm -hmm. And then the other large concept that I love is the meridian theory, which are just these energy pathways between the organs and, um, and just parts of the body and how that flows. And that's one thing that's amazing with the food you eat, if you use acupuncture or breathing techniques or um, meditation and things like that, it's all about making sure that these channels are open and flowing because when they're not and there's stagnation, that's when disease occurs. So acupuncture is essentially Chinese medicine that not only deals with the physical rehabilitation, but also mm -hmm. unplugs a lot of the emotional channels that may be blocked. Yes. Can you, can you, can you tell us, because, you know, to a lot of people, they don't understand it. They don't understand, you know, pins in the body and how that could possibly unblock emotional channels. Yeah. So again, I guess what I would say is right. So each organ or organ system, um, correlates with an emotion, right? So, but so for another example is the liver the emotions for the liver are anger, resentment, and sadness. So that is a really huge spectrum. And most people at some point have felt one of those three, right? Sure. But then you also know there are quite a few people that um, get agitated and tend to be more on the kind of like angry, fiery side, right? And so what we do for that is there are certain herbs or use the liver channel to kind of drain those emotions. And the same as so you pick the right foods to eat that help that or, or herbs. And so one thing that I love about Chinese nutrition and Chinese herbs is that basically each food or herb talks about the organ that it helps nourish or support. Um, and then also has a temperature and a taste. So these tastes do different things for the organs and then the same, the, the temperature. So one example would be, um, we distinguish, right? If somebody has phlegm or a cough, if it's white phlegm or yellow phlegm, because if it's white, that means it's a little more cool mm -hmm. of a pathogen or a bug that you have or virus. So you need warming herbs and warming foods. So that would be more of a, like a ginger tea. Mm -hmm. versus if you already had a heat pathogen or yellow phlegm, ginger tea is not what you would take, right? So this is kind of similar to how Ayurvedic medicine works as well. They're just two kind of side-by-side -side systems that have a lot of overlapping. So, um, so symptomatically, you could either have hot or cold, essentially, and you want to treat it with the, with the, the correlating... Right. Yeah. hot or cold treatment mm -hmm. where kind of in, like in western medicine even holistic kind of nutrition they don't always make those uh they don't distinguish between those and so to me 
it's just this further refining of the proper herbs and foods and things like that to use, right? Yeah, I mean, because it, it's sort of like, you know, you go down the, the rabbit hole of, okay, I'm not feeling well, I have chronic issues, I'm gonna clean up my lifestyle and clean up my diet. And so I'm gonna just stick with salads and, oh, yeah. and fish and, you know, nothing crazy like pizza anymore. However, like different lettuces, and different greens have a whole other defense mechanism built into them. Right. Yeah. Is, this is what I'm learning right now. I feel but so smart. <laughs> and so, you know, spinach may be actually toxic to you. Well, in a bunch. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't prescribe the low oxalate diet very often, but at the same time, what I do talk to people about is if their oxalates are elevated on the lab test, which often they are for people that have chronic mold, candida, or even Lyme and different co-infections. We want to see basically those are being created as a byproduct of those toxins in your system, as opposed to the food that you're putting in, right? But if you are someone who is putting spinach in your smoothie every day, and then you're eating kale, and then you're having, um, you know, whatever, tons of black tea, then we need to look at that and refine it. But I don't just put people on a low oxalate diet because it's elevated. We want to see why it's elevated. Is that actually something that's happening internally from your gut microbiome being out of balance? So is that part of your initial testing, the oxalates? Um, it's in the organic acid test, which is my favorite test probably ever invented. <laughs> Tell me about that. So it gives so much information. It checks about 75 markers. Um, it is just a urine test that gets sent to your home and then you ship it back to very easy. So even easy for kids, right? They just have to be in a cup and it checks. So the first whole page is all microbial overgrowth. So there's a whole yeast and fungal section has candida, has five mold markers. And then the, the next half of the page is all bacterial overgrowth. So really, really good to see what's going on gut wise of overgrowth and see how that's impacting your absorption and what well, in the whole in your system right then oxalates are part of that the next page we look at it shows neurotransmitters many neurotransmitters can be affected right by especially by mold exposure and dopamine but we want to see you know if someone is having anxiety if it's actually from these overgrowths Right, in the gut, as opposed to an actual neurotransmitter imbalance, which isn't as common. Really? So most of it is, you're seeing is not an actual neurological issue, it's more a gut issue. Well, we wanna rule out the gut issue first, because yeah. that is much easier, right? Once you can clean that up and see that more balanced, then you can see actually somebody, what you're dealing with, right? If it's anxiety or depression um, or, you know, how those neurotransmitters really are. That's fascinating. How cool is it to be in for little kids, right? Like there's all these little kids being put on anxiety meds and antidepressants. And honestly, you know, their candida is through the roof and there's usually um, often a lot of mold markers are elevated, but again, it's, you know, it's, it's one of the trickiest things. And this is what's so interesting to me, right? Is a kind of like a low, or a, you know, a Lyme diet is very similar to a, what, what would be for someone that was exposed to mold, right? So a lot of these biotoxins feed off the same things, right? They love sugar. Mm. So, but trying to get people off sugar, I would say is hands down the hardest thing for someone to change. Yeah, I bet, I bet you see a lot of that in your, in your practice. And, you know, it is, it's hard because because it's the year 2022. And I mean, you'd, all you have to do is walk down a two aisles in the grocery store and realize what we're up against. No, it's true. And I think most people, if, when they don't notice something so quick from how they, when, from when they eat something to how they feel, then they, they're not as accustomed to thinking, oh, 
this is impacting my health, right? I, that's one thing I would say is that I have always been quite sensitive to food. So like when I accidentally would get something like a gluten or dairy within 30 minutes, I can tell, and it's not good, right? But that's not that normal, right? Because it's not an allergy, but I will start to get a headache or joint pain. And I think, oh shoot, there must've been something in that that I didn't realize, or maybe I decided, you know, for many years, for like 10 plus years, I just cheated, right? Like once a week and I thought, it's better than not having it all the time, but you never really get to a, a great baseline when you're doing that. So hard. I mean, food is... Yeah. Food is a, such a, a tricky one. And I'm like you, or at least I was when, when I first discovered something was really, really wrong. That was my barometer. I would eat. And then all of a sudden I would, it's like my throat was swelling up oh. about 30 minutes after I ate something. And I mean, oh, all, my, all my allergy tests came back normal. Oh, and I was, yeah. you know, it was really scary in the beginning. Um, so, so it's hard to get in, in touch with that. And and, well, and and so for you, like you had something that was more, was very scary, right? Cause it was impacting your ability to breathe. Right. So I think I was actually just thinking about this the other day because so many people just discount, right. Sensitivities and things like that, where with, if it's an allergy, then everyone's like, Oh, you know, <laughs> you can't have it where everyone is still always for you know just have a little bit it's just a little pizza it's just you know oh but you can have it sometimes and I'm just like well not if unless I want to feel horrible or have a migraine <laughs> no one picks that right yeah I, I often you know I'll notice it after I go away for a week or five days on vacation or something like that because of course yeah you're on vacation and you might not be you might not have the foods accessible to you so you do the best you can but when you get back from vacation oftentimes you just hit the wall and it's it's really hard to get back on track after that well and I was going to say too so for many years I always thought the food was the problem right so I thought oh the gluten's the problem the dairy's the problem but it's not it's it's your internal terrain being fed by these inflammatory foods that again I just thought oh okay you know if I can just avoid these forever then I'm symptom free right and then more symptoms start happening and you're like wait I didn't eat any of the <laughs> stuff I'm not supposed to eat yeah and, and so, that's that's so frustrating with so many people with Lyme disease they're yeah. doing they're saying I am doing everything okay. perfectly I have not had you know whatever in two years and and I, my heart bleeds for them because they're not getting to the root cause. Yeah. No matter what they're doing, they're for whatever reason they're missing a major block. And yeah. that's why I love people like you. I mean that that can actually and maybe I mean obviously you've you know had a possible exposure to Lyme disease, but oh, so, well, I yes, and I I did when I was going through all of that with. Um, retesting thing I did like a very full Lyme co-infection panel and almost all were positive oh my gosh so then you know and, and I just was like no <laughs> but I don't identify with this you know what I mean I was like that's just neck pain and joint pain that I get from gluten <laughs> so, it's really it is hard to um, also wrap your brain around it not being something that can be healed in the conventional way that we're used to healing something. You know, I wasn't able to walk very well in the beginning. Wow. And yeah. I went to two specialists, did many tests. And when they really came to me and said, there's just, your foot is in perfect condition. And I was, I couldn't even tie my shoes because it would have it just hurts so bad. So I'm walking everywhere with my shoes untied. Wow. And I, and that was a hard moment for me to realize because I knew when they said that I knew without a shadow of a doubt, it was neurological and it, it had to do with a systemic issue. Nothing was fractured in my foot. There was no reason for that to be happening. And that is, that is when you realize this is a, this is going to take a while. Yeah. And I think that is also something because like, even for myself, you, you get impatient and I'm always talking to my patients about 
you know, there's going to be ups and downs. And, and again, I just, like I said, in the last six months, I was just thinking, you know, I was just racking my brain of why these symptoms came back that I just hadn't had unless I ate improperly or, you know, had things that I wasn't supposed to. And then, um, you know, and then I was, then it just sort of clicks and you go, oh, okay, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was not something that I ever um, thought was in my health puzzle. Mm -hmm. Right. And especially I have because I had worked with so many people before the headline, I just thought this is, I, these are not the patients I want. These are really sick. They have a lot going on. And then, um, you know, sometimes though, these things, I would say most people, if you're dealing with mold, it's often, you know, they often can go together. I've seen them together so much. Right. And does, and that has to do with your reaction to the histamines I, or it's a histamine thing or I think it's just, I mean, what seems to be honestly is I think uh, Lyme and co-infections are so much more prevalent than we know and are trans, you know, people can get them without knowing it, right? A, an infection or a bite. And so I think there's just a lot of people that have a lot of things going on and they're just not aware because the, A, the testing has been so terrible and it's expensive and the same with uh, mycotoxin testing, right? It used to be very expensive and it's not as much anymore. So it's much more readily available to see these layers. But again, a lot of people have all these layers and it's knowing how to put it together without overwhelming the system, right? Most of my clients are really, really sensitive. So I have patients that you have to do a pinch of something, right? Up to there's people that like myself, I try high doses of things just to try them to make sure. And because I'm not sensitive in that regard, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just to me, and that's the most fun part is putting the layers together, trying to like really look into the history, see what was contributing to this and, and then how to unravel the pieces. Right. But then still have it to your functional. That's the big thing. Like I, you know, there shouldn't be some giant reaction from a protocol that you're on. Right. And you you know, if you if there is, we we adjust. And I know that you also use different techniques in terms of light color therapy, herbs, flower essences, also, you know, essential oils, which is something that a lot of people want to try and they go online and buy things, but unless you really are educated in how to use them, whether you use them in food or a mist humid, humidifier, or just even just smelling them. Right. I'm sure, you know, what, it, what would, um, if you are suffering from Lyme disease, what, how would you um, advise somebody with regard to essential oils? Because I know that also there can be a Herxheimer reaction as well. So yeah, so if you're somebody who's already quite sensitive and you know that react, you react to things, then I would definitely be cautious with essential oils on, you know, applying them directly, right? So there's a lot of there, or if you're someone who's sensitive, then that's when I would use a diffuser for sure. Um, I love oils. I've used them for 20 years. Again, though, I'm not sensitive to them unless it's something synthetic and you can tell, right? Pretty quick. I, I can tell pretty quickly if something's um, not quite right. So I would say, cause oils are one of the most adulterated products I think probably out there. So a lot of synthetics sort of creep in there. And if you're already sensitive to chemicals, that's not good, but you know, a really basic one that I love is lemon oil, right? It's nice and supporting for the liver citrus oils in Chinese medicine. So they are uplifting and they move chi so like energy and uh, in the body is we need things moving right right so any sort of citrus is amazing for diffusing also because you know a lot of people it gets really sad when you have these chronic things and you just wonder when you're going to get better um and not as common one that's my absolute favorite is green mandarin because so in chinese medicine you have it's a green version of mandarin so it's basically the anything with a green color 
supports the liver. Mm -hmm. And then you have the mandarin, which is the chi mover. So you basically are helping move the liver chi, which is generally the most stuck out of any, anything. And that deals with processing toxins better. And then that sort of like um, anger, irritability, resentment, and depression. So wow. often people can, like I said, will find themselves in that spectrum of emotions at some time, or even for women, like right before their cycle and they're more irritated, things like that. And are you just dropping that in water and digesting yeah, that? You can use a diffuser. Um, again, I'm someone who uses oils, neat and topical, but I, you know, dilute it if you're Okay, and I'm just saying, but I'm clarifying that nobody, you should not be orally ingesting these. Oh, no. Okay. I mean, people do, I do, but I don't suggest to patients. You never know how someone's going to react. Right. And oils are super concentrated, right? So. And then flower essences, I'm assuming that's sort of herbal teas and different. Um... So flower essences, I don't know if you've heard of the Bach flower remedies. They are basically almost like a homeopathic infusion of a flower I guess it's kind of a good way to say it so it's more along the very subtle vibrational um tinctures so rescue remedy is a really popular one that is used for stressful situations so it's a great one for kids or kind of anyone going through these chronic illnesses that's so great and there's I another one I love called elm which is for overwhelm so when people feel like you know, life is too much or you have too many things to do and you don't have the energy, right? Or even the motivation. And that's a really wonderful one, especially for kids in stressful situations too. Well, I think I could talk to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, you, you are so knowledgeable in so many different areas and we just really touched the surface. So I hope that we get to work again together in the future. And I also wanted to just ask you, you know, what are some final thoughts that you would have to anybody out there with chronic pain, chronic illness, Lyme disease, and that you could offer to them today? I think a couple things, right? So if people, if you go to practitioners and they tell you your labs are normal, you have to either keep digging and find another one, right? That is gonna look deeper and also to find somebody that can put all the pieces together, right? So that's, a, I think that's a big thing. Everything is so segmented and we do have our specialties, right? But again, you want to find someone that can kind of put a lot of these pieces together to see and identify the root causes for you and how to go about uh, resolving them. And unfortunately, I would say it always takes longer than you think, right? And, you know, we want to basically get better as fast as we can, but it's a long process. Most people have been sick for decades and, and it's an ongoing process, right? It's not like you are magically cured and then you never need to do anything again, right? It's a change of your lifestyle. But I always encourage all of my clients to know that you know, we will find the answer and you can get better. And it's really important that you have that mentality um, and try to reinforce that and know that your body is made to heal. Absolutely. And there is hope for everyone out there and that, and that you know, um, you, you will, in many ways, your life will be better. And in yes. some ways, yeah. your, your lifestyle will be different, but in many, many ways, your life will be better and more more enriching. And Dr. Ashley, you are one of the most Lyme literate physicians that we've talked to in truly an LLMD because you understand the whole, the whole picture and how many angles you have to approach something like Lyme disease with. It's very complicated. As you said, it's different from person to person. And so I appreciate your, your philosophy. And can you just tell our, our listeners also how to get in touch with you, where you can be found? I'm sure. So my website is drashley.com. So just D-R-A-S-H-L-E-Y.com. So there's information on there. You can book an initial consultation through there. And on Instagram, I try to have a lot of lives and videos and things, but I'm on Instagram as Dr. Ashley Beckman. And that's, those are the most places I, I try to work with people in different levels and give education as well. And I know that it's a process, but yeah, definitely 
it can take a little while, but I'm here to support you through the journey and again, guide you, support you and do my best to figure out your health puzzle and your mystery symptoms and put it all together and create a plan for you. Well, we're appreciative that you are here and that you're working very hard on our behalf. So thank you again for, for uh, being a guest today. We look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you so much.